Striking and majestic, the French Alps are an enchanting sight. For thousands of years, people have lived and worked in the mountains or simply come to admire them. But scientists warn these ancient peaks are crumbling. Rising temperatures are melting permafrost, the frozen soil and ice that holds them together, speeding up erosion and triggering dangerous rockfalls. Glaciologist Florence Magnat says the high vertical rock faces of the Alps are particularly vulnerable to changes in temperature. We have noticed that in warm periods, particularly the last two or three decades, rockfalls have been more frequent than in past colder decades. Also, when the summers are very hot, as they were in 2003 and 2015, the rockfalls happened more often. Glaciers are also melting faster than before. There are 4,000 in the Alps chain that span seven countries. Scientists say half will have disappeared by 2050. Climate change is also transforming low-altitude mountains like those in the Vosges region in eastern France. It still snows here every winter in Ventron. The problem is the snowfall has become less reliable, the ski season much shorter. So that's why the operator this year has decided to close the resort. Thibaut Leduc's grandfather created this ski resort. His family have always run it. His aunt competed in the Olympics. Shutting the resort down wasn't an easy decision, but he says he had no choice. He now plans to build a luxury hotel to attract tourists all year round. All the ski stations face the same problem because to work you need snow at the right time during the holidays and good weather. So it's hard to have all that in a short season. We used to have a bad winter every decade. Now it's every three years, so it's impossible to recover. Rising temperatures have forced dozens of ski resorts to close in France in recent years. Scientists warned that unless more is done to stop climate change, snow-capped mountains and glistening glaciers may one day become things of the past. Natasha Butler, Al Jazeera, Ventron, Les Vosges. Well, let's speak to Chandra Bhushan. He's the executive director of iForest, the International Forum for Environment, Sustainability and Technology. And he joins us now from New Delhi. Chandra, we've just been watching there a report about how climate change is affecting one of the richest countries on the planet. And I know you're contending with widespread impacts there in India, too. I mean, for so long, negotiations around carbon cuts were about common but differentiated responsibilities, the rich and poor divide about who should do what. Do you think we're beyond that now? I think we are beyond that because we are running short of time, as your report shows. And as most of the scientific report that has come out in the last few months, you know, one of the one of the uh, interesting thing that happens in climate change is before uh, December, you get to see a lot of updated report on what is happening across the world. Mm. And we now have report from World Meteorological Organization, UNEP, and everyone is saying that we are hurtling towards uh, a climate catastrophe because the challenges are increasing, the impacts are increasing, whereas the efforts that countries are putting in, in terms of reducing emissions as well as uh, adapting to climate change uh, is really falling short. So yes, I, I, I mean to say we now have to think about a global cooperative mechanism. There will still be difference between developed and developing countries in terms of who can do what, because after all, developing countries have less capacity. But that, that division that has actually made negotiations very difficult and ambition, uh, uh, difficult to uh, increase the ambition, we will now have to get past it and start talking about how do we help each other, how do we build a global cooperative mechanism to, to get the work done. After all, you know, uh, it is about lives of people that mm -hmm. we are talking about. You mentioned some of the forecasts there. I see Climate Tracker now has the planet on course for a, a 2.1 degree rise by 2100. And I know you personally estimate that at being closer to 3.2 degrees, given the current investments in fossil fuels. I mean, these are hugely devastating scenarios. Can you paint a picture for us as to what that would look like? Listen, a number of countries have given mid-century targets saying that they are going to become net zero emission by 2050. Now, number of researchers are projecting 2.1 degree and 2.2 degree based on 2050 target. But we all understand political cycles. Mm. And 
while it is uh, uh, important to give a 2050 target and every country uh, is encouraged to do that, it is much more important to give five-year target so that we can measure it, we can verify it, we can see whether countries are taking action or not. And therefore, I think this message that is going out is that we are on track to 2.1 actually is quite damaging. I think uh, we will have to give this message with a lot of disclaimers. Mm -hmm. The fact is the current targets that countries have put on the table is for 3.2C. Now, just to, I just wanted to clarify this point, but to paint the picture, the fact is 3.2 degrees is, is, is unheard of. I, I'm, I'm, it's very difficult for uh, a scientist to actually project a world how it is going to impact people at 3.2 degrees. Because even models, uh, I mean to say, we can give you a broader picture of what is going to happen. But at the end of the day, there are, there are communities who are going to be devastated at 3.2 degrees. You're talking about Alps. In India, we have Sundarbans, which is going to be devastated. We have alpine meadows. We have grasslands. Uh, we have such uh, you know, uh, vulnerable ecosystems and communities dependent on the, those, those ecosystems. They are going to be devastated at even 1.5 degrees, leave 3.2 degrees. So we are, as I started by saying, we are dealing with people. I, I think in this entire scientific debate, we miss that picture of, of the most vulnerable community, uh, which is already suffering and, and is going to be devastated. Well, you mentioned the politics around these negotiations, and it's really always felt like climate negotiations have been situated within economics, potentially, rather than a sense of moral collective action. But it does seem that we are seeing this growing awareness that a, a shift towards a green economy actually makes more financial sense. Do you think that is might is that could actually be what saves us, the fact that it would actually make people more money to do that? See, uh, I think the, the point that you made about green economy is probably the only saving silver lining that I see right now uh, 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 in, a, in a way that renewables are becoming real. Uh, electric vehicle is, is going to become uh, you know, much more cost competitive in the next few years. Uh, we, we, uh, electric cooking, uh, I mean to say fossil fuel, the, the trend that we are following right now on clean energy and clean technology if we all work together collectively, we can make fossil fuel history in next 10 to 15 years. I'm literally, uh, I, I'm saying this because in India, for example, today, solar power is 40% cheaper than coal power. Mm. A new solar plant will come at half the cost of a, uh, of a coal plant. Now, these are, uh, these are dramatic changes that has happened in last five years. Uh, since we have signed the Paris Agreement. Now, countries need to recognize that there is a stock of fossil fuel uh, infrastructure that we have. In fact, the difficulty today is not in building clean infrastructure, but how do we get rid of the old infrastructure mm -hmm. that we have? And therefore, on one hand, countries will have to work on building new clean infrastructure and green infrastructure, and which is, as you rightly said, is profitable. But we also have to start talking about closing down old infrastructure. And that's where the transition has to be also just because, for example, coal communities will suffer and we don't want them to suffer as well. And we will have to think about how do we transition coal plant and coal mining areas. Those are the things that the world will also have to do. So on one hand, we will have to do energy transition. On the other mm -hmm. hand, we will also have to work on just transition of communities which is going to suffer. Of course. Chandra Bhushan there from iForest, reminding us of the need for urgent action there. Thanks for being with us on Al Jazeera, Chandra. Great to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much.